Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, everybody, uh, especially Representative Lowe, for conducting this study. Um, it's a very important issue, um, and I'm just very grateful to have the time today. Um, my name is Jill Menke, and I'm the Youth Justice Policy Analyst at Oklahoma Policy Institute. Um, I came into this position uh, being informed by my experience as a family preservation specialist, and I saw firsthand a lot of the issues that children and families deal with and that we don't have enough support for families to empower them, to take control of their lives, but also to support kids as they grow up. So at Oklahoma Policy, we use data-informed approaches to inform and uh, build toward an Oklahoma where all families can thrive. Um, so similarly, in the youth justice system, my experience so far has been informed by the many families and children who say that their needs have not been met by this system and that they were desperate for something different. So that's why I brought this presentation forward today. I and the other presenters will be talking in depth about diversion and their experience in the youth justice system and how we can use diversion as a tool to both keep kids away from the prison and court system, but also empower them with the tools that they need to thrive and succeed in life. So, um, yeah, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So going over my agenda today, um, so what is the purpose of the juvenile justice system, how it works, why we have it, how often diversion is used, what it is, and why we use it. Review how other states use diversion. So uh, we'll talk a little bit in depth about that. And then I'll end the presentation with what we could be doing different, differently in Oklahoma to better utilize diversion. So what is the purpose of the juvenile justice system? Coming up with a definition for this is very hard. Um, it's hard to pin down an exact definition or purpose of what the system does or what it's for, but what I can say is there are many different pieces and system actors at play. You have law enforcement, you have the court system, you have the Office of Juvenile Affairs, county government, community partners, service providers, and uh, agencies, and we also have the youth themselves. Um, in an ideal world, all of those pieces would communicate well, work together to help work toward a singu singular goal, with prevention and treatment being the primary methods the juvenile justice system uses to address juvenile delinquency. Um, however, there are other pieces of the system that might set their focuses on other goals, which are also important, but like public safety, uh, justice, or carrying out the letter of the law, all important things. But what the system doesn't always agree on what should be the top priority. And so I point out the Office of Juvenile Affairs mission here to collaborate with youth, families, and community partners to create pathways to success through prevention and treatment for all Oklahoma youth. And I point this out because truly, everybody with different goals in mind, justice, following the letter of the law, working through the court system, can work in tandem with prioritizing pre prevention and treatment for Oklahoma youth. So I talk a little bit about our youth justice system's history because I think it's really important context to some of the issues we're seeing today, especially in our detention centers across the state. So in 1969 is when you see Oklahoma's Children's Code established, and this creates the framework for the juvenile code that we know today, Title 10A. Um, and then in 1974, the federal government passed the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. And what this did is it created a set of standards and required states to follow reforms if they accepted federal funding. Oklahoma did not accept this federal funding, and it shielded them from scrutiny and oversight from the federal government. Oklahoma would go over 20 years without accepting federal funding for juvenile justice and delinquency prevention. Um, and that would go until 1996. Shortly after the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act was enacted, the infamous Terror D lawsuit was filed on behalf of seven teenage plaintiffs, which led to the discovery of really horrific conditions faced by children in the state custody and cared for by our institutions. And this lawsuit was a catalyst for many different changes to come to Oklahoma's youth justice system. That includes the establishment of the Oklahoma Commission on Children and Youth, OCCY. This was, a, this was established in response to the Terry D. lawsuit. 
Um, it also led to a federal court decree that said how the state could treat youth in state custody in 1984. Um, this consent decree reduced the number of state detention beds from 1,200 to 220 and cost the state millions of dollars to correct the widespread abuse of youth in our custody. So that moves us to 1994, which is when the Oklahoma Youthful Offender Act was created. Um, this is a law that plays a major role in how youth move through the system and how it functions today. And under this law, young people may be tried as a youthful offender depending on the age and the nature of their offense. So in 1995, shortly after the Youthful Offender Act was passed, the Office of Juvenile Affairs was established. Um, and this is what we see now as the sole facilitator of youth justice issues and programming. We're Previously, the Department of Human Services was in charge. However, creating the Office of Juvenile Affairs wouldn't be the end of civil rights lawsuits that we saw from the 80s on. So in 2004, a second civil lawsuit was filed against the Lloyd E. Rader Juvenile Detention Center. Um, and this was after, this was six years after the conclusion of Terry D. Um, the federal investigation eventually led to a lengthy and costly litigation, United States versus State of Oklahoma. Records from this lawsuit showed that juveniles and staff members at Raider reported 1,277 assaults in a span of just three years. This lawsuit eventually led to the closure of the L.E. Raider Juvenile Detention Center, and this led the legislature to take action. They formed a Juvenile Justice Reform Committee and created recommendations that are a lot of the same recommendations I'm going to be talking about today. They wanted to expand evidence-based community programs, create more effective mental health and substance abuse treatment, and create more life skills training programs. But ultimately, budget cuts rendered a lot of these changes impossible while simultaneously requiring the reduction of supports that were already in place for youth. So budget shortfalls meant that improvements to the youth justice system had to come from legislation rather than programming and treatment. Um, so you see in 2015, the passage of uh, juvenile competency requirements, we became the last state to establish those. Um, and while we do lead the country in these standards, we don't have the services to properly address or remediate youth who are found incompetent. Then in 2020, we see the Juvenile Justice Protection Bill enacted, which prohibits children 12 years of age or younger from being placed in a state juvenile detention facility unless all alternatives have been exhausted and the child committed an offense that would be similar to what an adult would, would commit if it were a felony. Um, and they also have to do a risk assessment that determines that they need detention, they are a threat to public safety, and that's why we put them there. And that leads us to today, so how does our system work? I'll do a brief overview, as brief as I can, in case you're not familiar. So first, there's the pre-arrest period. So this is before an arrest has been made, maybe a crime has been committed, like maybe a child hit a baseball through a window. That could be destruction of property. So this is when the decision is made of when an arrest might be suitable for that child. So there hasn't been a referral officially made to the Office of Juvenile Affairs, an arrest hasn't been made. This is important to mention because this is a decision point. Whether law enforcement intervene or not is up to them. Um, so at this point, you can still receive services um, by being referred to a diversion program at this point. It's not widespread, but you could be referred to diversion here. So then you move to the referral stage. This is when a law enforcement officer either makes an arrest or they can also make an official referral to the Office of Juvenile Affairs that a young person is in need of services. And then they would move along to a youth service agency or some sort of programming. Now, this stage may involve detention if law enforcement deems it necessary. It's similar to the decision-making point where they decide to arrest or not. They also decide whether to use detention or not. Um, so this makes law enforcement a very natural decision point of when diversion can be used. Um, we know that out of the 12,000 referrals that happen to OJA every year, 85% of those come from law enforcement. So 
This is important to mention, too, because there's no mandate that if this is a first-time misdemeanor offense or something really small that a young person does, I mentioned the destruction of property earlier, that's something that a law enforcement officer can make the decision to arrest for, even if they're not a threat to public safety, or they could use the decision to use detention. So at this stage, law enforcement makes the referral. It might be elevated to court involvement further on, but I'll talk about that in a moment. So at this stage, you also have juvenile service workers who might refer that young person to mental health treatment. They do screenings to see if they might need mental health or substance abuse treatment. They might need counseling. They might need to go to therapy. They have a lot of trauma. Um, and then they also might have programming that might help that young person make better decisions. We have the first-time offender programs that you'll hear you save service agencies talking about in a bit. Um, or they might learn how to take better care of themselves. It might be a very holistic problem that the reason that kid acted out is because they weren't taking care of themselves or their parent wasn't taking good care of them. So after a referral could come court involvement or formal processing in court through adjudication. So this doesn't always happen after a referral and most of the time it doesn't, but this is the next stage in the process. So when a referral is made, a young person is given recommendations from their juvenile services worker, or those recommendations can come from the court process. So they've made an official judgment. You are guilty of destruction of property. This is what your treatment plan is going to be. And that happens at this stage. This is also a very natural point to offer diversion if, it's, if it seems appropriate. So a lot of the time when I'm talking about diversion today, I'm talking pre-court but it can also be offered at the court involvement stage. So a judge might refer a youth to a program similar to a juvenile services worker, but it has the extra layer of process and procedure behind it. Many youth do not understand what is happening in court when they're subjected to it or understand the consequences of what's happening to them. There's also the added pressure of services being required for youth who are court involved, and they're not as bought into the process because A, they don't understand it, and B, they don't have a say in their treatment options. You know, this child might need mental health treatment, but in the court process, if they're mandated to do something else, they can't advocate for themselves in that moment because they don't understand the process. So this stage would also be a natural decision point to offer diversion, like I mentioned, and it often is, but we can't speak to what those services look like because they're not used widespread. So this leads us to the treatment plan stage, which might be better known to those who work in the criminal legal system as sentencing. But in the youth justice system, we use the term treatment plan because we're trying to set youth on a new path. This is not a sentence, and that's a feature, not a flaw of the juvenile justice system. So when a young person may complete services that they've been recommended by a juvenile services worker or required to plead as a part of court involvement, this may include placement. You'll see in the slides in your folders that this says detention. That's a, mis that's a mistypo. It should be placement. So placement refers to when a young person might complete their treatment plan in a level E group home or a central Oklahoma juvenile faci facility or COJAC. These are higher security than a detention center might be. But it means that they're completing their treatment plan outside of their home or community in a more secure environment. And finally, that leads us to re-entry, which is the period of time after completing a treatment plan, uh, placement, or detention. Um, this sometimes involves formal programming, and sometimes it doesn't. I can't really speak to how often re-entry services are used. So keeping all of that in mind, I'm showing this graph because we need to go in depth about the racial makeup of the youth justice system. So this graph shows us our state population with the yellow bars. So you see that as a percentage of the total state population. And then with the blue bars, you see the percentage of youth adjudicated and referred. Blue bars are referred and the red are adjudicated. So you can see that these are broken down into percentages of the population that belong to a certain race or ethnicity. So on the bottom, you see American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian Pacific Islander, and so on. Um, so one very important takeaway here is I want us all to look at the black knot of Hispanic origin column. Um, you can see that 7.9% of our state's population are black folks. And then once they become involved in the juvenile justice system, they make up 26.4% of referrals 
and as they move further into the system, make up an even higher percentage of adjudications. So this is also prevalent, as you can see, for American Indian and Alaska Native kids. They're more likely to be referred, and also with Hispanic youth. So I say all of this to say that we see some disparities, and there's no evidence to support that Black youth, Hispanic youth, or American Indian or Alaska Native youth are more criminogenic, or that they commit offenses at higher rates. It just means that they are being referred more often, and that they are treated differently in the system. And that hasn't improved since we started looking at this data. So there's a lot of things we could do to fix this, and that's why I'm here today. This is a huge problem, and as I mentioned the, before, the purpose of our youth justice system should be to create pathways to success, to prevent delinquency, and treat youth who commit crimes. Our youth justice system, with all of its moving pieces, although well-meaning, does not always create pathways to success for youth, and that's why I'm talking about diversion. So what is diversion? Diversion, using the definition that the Office of Juvenile Affairs uses, is when a referral to services occurs outside of the juvenile court system. So for the purposes of our study today, diversion from the court system, once they become court involved, is also a feature that we could use and talk about. So why should we use diversion? Diversion is often more suitable for youth who commit status offenses or youth who are experiencing mental health distress. If you're not familiar, a status offense is not necessarily a crime, but is prohibited under the law because of the youth's status as a minor. This includes skipping school, running away, or violating curfew. We know from our research that on a national level, for those types of offenses, detention is used too often for youth who pose a minimal risk to public safety. Um, we also know that while in Oklahoma, we may utilize detention or the court system to address status offenses at a lower rate than the rest of the country, which is a success, we still use it to treat status offenses, and that's a problem. We looked in our data, and that's about 61 individuals who, are, who have been adjudicated in court for a status offense, like running away, truancy, something of that sort. So we also know that formal involvement in the justice system can be counterproductive to public safety and youth well-being. Once arrested, youth who are formally charged in juvenile courts do far worse than those whose cases are diverted from court. Research studies consistently find that being arrested in adolescence substantially increases the likelihood of future justice system involvement and reduces future success in school and work. Involvement in the justice system is also often subject to biased decisions, especially in the case of when to use detention. We know that our law enforcement are doing their best, but as humans, we are just subject to bias, and that's a fact. Um, so because of that, we know that the decisions at the early stage in the justice system process, like when to arrest, when to use detention, are often subject to substantial biases against youth of color, and that these biased decisions around diversion are a factor in the disparities we saw on the graph earlier. If the negative outcomes that youth experience as a part of youth justice system involvement is unconvincing, studies also find that diverted youth experience better outcomes than youth who are not. They experience far lower likelihood for subsequent arrests, they're less likely to be incarcerated as an adult. They commit less violence. They have higher rates of school completion and college enrollment, and they earn higher incomes in adulthood. So let's try to examine how we use diversion currently in Oklahoma. How, as I mentioned earlier, diversion is a pretty loose term, and it's difficult to track in data, but I will do my best to explain how we use diversion given the data we have. So looking at referrals to OJA, 73% of referrals to OJA are not adjudicated. Yeah. yeah. Give me one second. I would like to recognize Representative Lowe for a question. I do have a question for Yeah. You. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, I've been practicing for over 20 years. And what I usually do is um, some of my clients go through the process of an ISP. Usually with ISP, they're supposed to provide services to the youth. Why do you believe diversion is better 
as opposed to actually having those services, um, those mental health services or a counselor or, uh, or a um, big brother. Uh, why are those services not as effective as, say, diversion? Yeah, absolutely. So those services are less effective because it's difficult for youth to buy in when they feel like they are being told what to do. And that's just a human nature thing. A lot of kids, especially if they're justice involved, are more likely to rail against the standards that you put for them when they tell them you have to do this. So why diversion is so important and why need, we need to use it before the court involvement stage is so that youth are bought in and they feel more attached to the outcome of their diversion services. Representative, you're recognized. Thank you. And wouldn't you agree that once someone is in a system, sometimes you cannot get out of the system? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really great point. I would say that like a big reason a lot of families and youth find themselves in the cycle of violence and the cycle of the juvenile justice system is because that's all they know. It's all they have known and they don't know anything different. And that's why diversion is so important because we have programs that can teach kids a different way. We have programs that could connect people to mentorship. People who have experienced this and could show them a different way. So. I'm gonna go back to the diversion slide here. So we know that 73% of referrals to OJA are not adjudicated. So we could call this informal diversion, but we don't know how many of that 73% are getting services. So to say that they're diverted and receiving services isn't exactly accurate. Um, so looking at all referrals, all of them, that's about 13,000 referrals. 52% um, of them were for misdemeanor offenses. Diving further into those misdemeanor offenses, we know that 26% of misdemeanor offenses result in adjudication or formally processing in court. And we're talking, you know, I can go into the, some of the offenses in a bit, but they're formally processed in court for low level misdemeanor offenses. Of those misdemeanor adjudications, they have not been charged with a felony or any other offense. And furthermore, those individuals who are adjudicated in court have had their very first interaction with the juvenile justice system. So before they are even given a chance, they're subject to court involvement and being told you are a criminal, this is where it ends for you, and court involvement is what you need and deserve. When really what would be more effective for these types of offenses would be diversion. So we have programs specifically designed for first time offenders. You'll hear youth service agencies talk about it, but this is a great place to offer diversion and we don't use it enough. So I have here for you the top 10 misdemeanor offenses that have no accompanying felony charges. So you see possession of a firearm by a minor, different types of, and classes of assault and battery. You have possession of controlled or dangerous substances, marijuana, drug paraphernalia. You have assault again. I could go on. But when we look at those who have not been adjudicated, right, same offenses, they are exactly the same. So whether a court system or actors in the system decide that this person needs diversion or they do not is totally arbitrary. We are treating people who commit the same offenses differently. That's the takeaway. Whether misdemeanor cases are adjudicated or not does not differ across offenses, meaning that youths receive different treatment for the same offense. So looking at cases that have a final legal status, um, we know that 47% receive informal diversion or targeted diversion tools. Um, but I mentioned earlier, we don't have any sort of law on our books that requires law enforcement, prosecutors, and so on to offer diversion first for first time offenses. So looking at those cases with a final legal status, um, we know that we see first-time offender programs with 3.9% being first-time offender program referrals. We know that of those who have committed a misdemeanor offense, that's 600 youth that are not being offered this program. 
So this doesn't capture all of the cases that might benefit from diversion if this was not their first offense, but it does give us a, a picture of how often we are using it. So taking a look at deferred filing and informal adjustment, um, we don't know exactly what services those youth are receiving. All this tells us is that they were waiting to file later, their court involvement was delayed, or that they received some sort of informal adjustment from the court system. So what can we do differently? How do other states use diversion? Let's look to our northern neighbor, Kansas. In 2016, Kansas created a new diversion option, which is the Immediate Intervention Program. This mandates the use of diversion for youth accused of first-time misdemeanors and authorized it for all misdemeanor offenses. So no matter the misdemeanor offense, they are offered diversion first. Nearly 2,000 youth were referred to IIP as a diversion from formal court processing in 2022. And furthermore, 92% successfully completed diversion by complying with the terms of their diversion agreements and avoiding a new adjudication or conviction. Then in South Dakota, in 2015, a comprehensive juvenile justice reform law made diversion the default option for first-time nonviolent misdemeanors, as well as status offenses, which you heard me talk about earlier. It began providing local courts also with the financial incentive for each young person who completes diversion. So that way courts are motivated to use diversion because we might look at diversion as taking money away from the courts. This gives them the financial incentive to be able to use the tool that works more effectively. Since then, South Dakota has increased the number of youth who are diverted by more than 50%, and it also sharply reduced the failure rates of youth in diversion. So when they use diversion more, youth were more successful in using it. So Representative Blood, recognize. Yeah. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Uh, in those particular states, states that you just mentioned, uh, Kansas and South Dakota, uh, could you describe the crime rates? Uh, I, in those particular states. I wouldn't be able to speak to those crime rates. All I know is how these diversion programs are utilized. Um, I, I can't speak to that, but I could definitely get back to you and do more research. But um, Kansas and South Dakota, I would say Kansas is pretty similar to us as a state. Um, I use them as a northern neighbor because they're pretty similar. Um, so. Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you. It would be helpful if you could also speak to recidivism rates for those kids who go through diversion. Yeah, I don't have that particular information with Kansas or South Dakota, but I do on the next slide. Um, so in Indiana, they did a 2022 juvenile justice reform law. A lot of these do comprehensive juvenile justice reform. Indiana created a grant program that provided state funding to support local diversion programs. This law also required the state to develop detailed parameters to guide the operation of the new diversion programs and also ensure that the programs follow best practices, create a data collection and analysis process to guide the development of those programs and track outcomes. And then in Kentucky, um, we have a comprehensive 2014 juvenile justice reform law that made diversion the presumptive option for youth accused of first time misdemeanor offenses though it allows judges and prosecutors to override that presumption based on the circumstances of each case. And in Kentucky, they saw the increase of the share of juvenile cases diverted statewide from 41% to 60% in 2020. And I just remembered on the previous slide, I have uh, the diversion completion rate. Um, I believe that they got this number by like, you see the 92% successful completion. That's a recidivism rate of like 8%. Um, and I can't speak to South Dakota, but that's Kansas's example. I can speak in general that diversion programs see much better rates of recidivism across the country than we see for formal court processing or detention or placement. Representative Fugate, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Maybe I'm using the term incorrectly because I'm not an attorney and I look around the room, there's a bunch of attorneys, but I think of recidivism as that next time that they are involved with justice. And that, does the 92% talk about that, or is it just that they successfully completed their program? They successfully completed the program and avoided a new adjudication or conviction. So part of their program then was staying out of trouble for X period of time. Right, and getting reinvolved with the system. Thank you. Yeah. 
So, yeah, those are how other states use diversion. What can we do differently in our state? We can follow the leads of these other states that are seeing success with their diversion programs and mandate diversion for low-level misdemeanor offenses so that we can see young people treated equally in the justice system. It's a real problem that we're seeing youth being treated differently for the same offense. So some ideas there, it would allow us to spend less money and time in court if we're diverting them from court processing. Um, and it also helps correct the problem of overrepresentation that we saw earlier. Um, I also mentioned like these other states, not every solution that other states implement will be exactly right for us in Oklahoma, but I think that we need to explore other options for misdemeanor diversion because the law isn't being applied equally. The law isn't working for the people. So we also have the opportunity to create more investment opportunities for youth service agencies to implement new diversion programs or strengthen the ones they already have. So I mentioned credible messengers or restorative justice, and I can give a quick definition, but credible messenger mentoring is essentially the idea that you take a person with previous justice system involvement and they are a mentor to youth. And that helps the youth see someone who looks like them, who has been through what they've been through and can attest things can be different for you. And they have seen really effective rates of recidivism in these programs. Um, same with restorative justice programs. So restorative justice is the idea that you meet with the person you wronged and you try to come to an agreement or an understanding of like, yes, I hurt you and yes, I am sorry. And that creates accountability in a relationship. And I have said this before, I think it's a really useful thing to remember that relationships are what re reduce recidivism. Creating that relationship and holding children accountable through restorative justice is way more effective for young people than court processing is. So I say all of this, the bottom line is that we don't use diversion programs in our state as much as we could. Um, and considering the burden that children in Oklahoma and their families face, there's just a lot more that we could do differently to serve them better. So that is the end of my presentation, but I am open to other questions. Thank you for your presentation, and we'll just uh, answer, take a few quick questions as we are behind schedule just a little bit. Representative Strong. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, but Mr. Acting Chairman. Uh, <laughs> as we go, like, like Representative Fugate, I'm, I'm I'm, I'm, pardon my ignorance, I'll say I'm kind of a farmer on this deal. Um, when we talk about diversion, in most cases, diversion kind of what we're talking about is, I mean, for lack of a better word, therapy. I mean, what we're, what we're getting into versus punishment. Well, sometimes. Sometimes it can include therapy like counseling, mental health counseling. It can also be like they go through a six-week course to learn how to make better decisions. Like first-time offender programs, it's often used for like you were caught smoking at school or something like that. How can we learn to make better decisions and not do things that get us in trouble? So it's kind of like therapy in a lot of ways, but it's more targeted, especially with those first-time offender programs. Um, I think the youth service agencies that are here today would be able to speak more to what those programs look like, but that's an example. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to, before yeah. we continued on, kind of get an idea of exactly what we were talking about when we talked about going that direction. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Representative Lowe. Thank you. <clears throat> when I was growing up, it seems like uh, everything was handled in-house. Either you got suspended from school or your parents got involved. Do you agree that like, everything seems to be criminalized now, where the first thing is arresting someone and getting them involved in the system, as opposed to trying to make sure that the family gets involved and try to correct the child's behavior? I would say it's something that we see in the data for sure. I mean, we, I, I talked about misdemeanors in particular because we see that like the first decision is court involvement or detention. And so the reason that isn't effective is because it's not treating the youth as a person that needs help. And often when kids misbehave, it's a cry for help. Like, please help me. And so especially for kids, we need to be talking about how we meet their needs when they're asking us for help. Mr. Chairman, you're recognized.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and to tie into Representative Lowe's point, you know, I think one thing we're missing here is the breakdown in the family, which has a major factor. Every study shows that a breakdown in family, missing parents, has a major factor in juvenile offenses. So, you know, I think you can look at a lot of other factors, but that still seems to be the bottom line. And like he says, getting the family involved, but if parents are not actively involved, any diversion program is probably not going to have uh, as much effect as parents who are involved in that kid and, and making some guidance and direction there. So I want to bring that point up. Secondly, one of the other thing I think that's uh, absent from this conversation, I'm assuming that you know, you're kind of more familiar with the Tulsa County, the T Oklahoma County type programs that are available. I live in Oklahoma County, so I'm more familiar here. But you know, from practicing in more of the rural counties, Comanche County, Tillman County, Cotton County, we don't have those programs available. Those are absent. You know, those diversion type programs up in Texas County, Cimarron County, they're not there. So we don't have those tools that you're discussing in there. The only thing we've got is court supervision. So, you know, in, in so many cases, what we have available in Tulsa and Oklahoma County, maybe Cleveland County, is completely different than what's available in the rest of the you know, 73, 74 counties. So it's hard to make a blanket statement um, as to, okay, you know, we've got to do diversion unless we address these other issues and that's having those tools available. We didn't really have a whole lot of options in Comanche County and in Cotton County or Tillman County. So, you know, how we address that is just as important of, you know, what to do, but how to do it. So what's the question? More of a statement, but if oh, you can address okay. that. Sure. Absolutely, yeah. So I think to your first point, you know, when youth services gets involved with the family, there are many programs that do try to treat the whole family. We have something called functional family therapy. I can go back and say how much that's used. I don't know if this is working. But uh, functional family therapy is something that is meant to treat the whole family. Um, you see FFT. It's used for 47 cases. And you could see we could use that a whole lot more, right? Because it often, like you mentioned, when a young person is getting involved with crime or making bad decisions, it's because something's wrong at home. And you're absolutely right on that. So I think that in order to do that, we have to expand how we use those services. FFT is not available in every county. You mentioned that. Um, and it's something that could definitely be expanded. And then I think to the point of those services not being available in Comanche, you say Tillman, absolutely that's a problem. So that's why my recommendation is twofold, right? I say that we need to invest more in our youth service agencies to be able to make those sorts of programs. We don't give youth service agencies the flexibility to try new things and things that could work for these counties. And so without the funding to be able to make those things happen, they can't try new things. And I think you're absolutely right. Those services don't exist there, but that's why we have to use a two-pronged solution. Make more programs for those counties and also make sure that they're using them by mandating diversion first. Um, we have somebody from Bryan County who is more of a rural area that can speak to the youth service programs that they offer. Um, I think that they could speak better to it than I can. Um, but you're absolutely right. I've met with um, youth service agencies in Guymon, Oklahoma. Can you imagine Guymon, how far you have to drive to get anywhere? And it's the same problem. You're absolutely right. And that's why I made that second recommendation. Oh, I also grew up in Ames, Oklahoma, so I know. <laughs> Town of 200 people. Mr. Chairman, what other, what agencies are available out there? You know, obviously we've got, you know, OJA. What other agencies, especially addressing our rural counties, what other agencies are out there besides OJA? Well, so OJA is the main way that youth service agencies get funding, right? They can offer, like, 
they can ask for federal funding or they can ask for funding from philanthropy, right? But the only way that youth service agencies can get money from OJA is if they're a certified youth service agency. So my knowledge of those outside of that system is not extensive, but I can't say that they don't exist because there are the ministry-based ones, right? Like there are church programs that might help with diversion or things of that nature, but I'm not as knowledgeable of those. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And yep, Representative Fugate. Thank you. Um, Chairman Worthen, what I think I heard you say more holistically, it's not just parents, it's just unhealthy home environments. And I think we would all agree on that. Um, the question I have relates to diversion. And if we went down a path of requiring diversion, it sounds like we don't have resources available in most of our counties to utilize diversion. So we would be in a no-win situation there. Does State Question 781 funding play a, a role in these diversion processes if we committed to funding it? I think it absolutely could. I can't speak to how they utilize those funds for juvenile programming specifically, because a lot of the times they work differently. When I talk about the youth justice system and criminal legal system differently, it's because they are very different and the services they receive are very different. So I think, th I mean, what you're saying is exactly why I'm saying we need to invest more in our youth service agencies on, across the state. They're the only, like, lifeline we have to be able to offer these services and require diversion. Because what I'm telling you is that although court services are all we have, they are not working for our kids in Oklahoma. And it's not making sense to continue doing something that isn't working. 